Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show. Oh my gosh, we have so much goodness for you today. Overnight, all eyes were on the campus of UCLA. University officials finally allowing LAPD and the California Highway Patrol to come in and fully dismantle an encampment build up, built up on the college campus. You know, they kind of tried to tear it down and then the students came back and now this was the final, we think, for now at least, tear down. But before it was actually dismantled, an LA-based freelance reporter named Anthony Cabasa went inside of it, and he has given us permission to show what he found. Look at this. The walls of one building spray-painted all over with messages like Free Gaza and Intifada. Well, they love that one. Protesters were seen wearing masks and headscarves to hide their faces. Some also donned, donned white protective hard helmets. That was weird. Here you see a makeshift barrier built out of large plywood boards. It had been rebuilt after being torn down the night before. A short time later, around 3 a.m. LA time, police moved in. Protesters all wearing those same white helmets, now armed with umbrellas, battling police. But they had totally in peaceful intentions. One protester screaming, this is a school, we fucking learn. This is a fucking school! This is a fucking school! What are you doing? This is a school! We fucking learn! Oh, you learn all right. You're going to learn the hard way, sir. Hear that, LAPD? They're just there for their studies. That's all just sweet little university co-eds and their boyfriends just trying to get a better education. I'm fair to fucking learn! At one point, the police retreated from the encampment. This is video from ABC Local in LA. Their chopper overhead clearly shows the officer pulling back. But eventually, the LAPD did move back in, and again, freelancer Anthony Cabasa was on the scene. You see LAPD officers busting through the encampment. These students tried to resist. By 9 a.m. this morning, the encampment was completely torn down. However, a New York Times reporter on the scene heard the protesters chanting, we will rebound with all of our fucking learning. <laughs> They're so sad. They can't resume. What do you mean? I thought we're here to learn. Let's do the learning, honey. Rebound exactly for what we're now asking. It's not going to go very well for you now that the cops are actually involved. That was the only thing that needed to happen here. It finally did happen. And now you're done. Okay. It's kind of fun watching you eat your own, but- with all the like Jew hatred you've been spewing, it got a little less fun and now you're done. Yesterday, a spokesperson for the encampment, you believe they have actual spokespeople, but I'm so glad that we met this woman. I've got a lot to say about a lot of these spokespeople. This particular gal let it be known that divestment is not really the end goal. She said the quiet part out loud. She wants to take down at least the whole university system. I think that it's more than divestment as well. Um, I think um, given the fact that the University of California is founded on colonialism, um, it's inherently a violent institution. There needs to be uh, an addressment of U.S. imperialism. Ah, okay. We got a lot. We haven't got a lot that we have to get to. <laughs> Thanks to these great protesters drawing our attention to all the colonialism everywhere. Joining me now... Our friends from the Fifth Column podcast, Michael Moynihan, Camille Foster, and Matt Welsh. Go support them at wethefifth.substack.com. Don't miss a moment. Subscribe to this show on YouTube and follow me on Insta, Facebook, and X. Like many of you, I've been trying to eat healthier these days, and that's why I love good olive oil. Oh, it makes such a nice difference if it's really good. And by good, I mean fresh. Olive oil packs the most flavor and healthiest nutrients when it's fresh from the farm. That's the problem with supermarket olive oils. They're not fresh. They can sit on the shelf for months growing stale. Now, I want to tell you about TJ Robinson, also known as the olive oil hunter. TJ's farm fresh oils have vibrant, grassy flavors. They're incredibly delicious on salad, veggies, pasta, meat, fish, you name it. And as an introduction to his fresh pressed olive oil club, TJ will send you a full-size $39 bottle of one of the world's finest artisanal olive oils, fresh from the new harvest, for just $1 to help him cover shipping. 
There's no commitment to buy anything now or ever. So you can get your free $39 bottle for just $1 in shipping and taste the difference freshness makes. Go to harvestfreshnow.com, harvestfreshnow.com for a free bottle and pay just $1 in shipping, harvestfreshnow.com. Guys, great to see you again. There's You're the perfect guest for today. My God, have we got some goodness <laughs> for you. Thank Let's you. just start with that lady. Um, it's all the colonialism is the real problem. Everything's violent here. And therefore mm. the real goal is just, I guess, the dismantling of structures, of structures like um, UCLA. What do you make of what's happening here? Who wants to do the first addressment? <laughs> yeah. Do you want to do an addressment? There's I so think. much for you. That every, uh, everyone can go first at some point because I have equally good stuff coming after this one. Michael, can you do a land addressment first? I, I want to first tell the people that are applying to UCLA next year that you can get a, a spokesman gig at the UC, at UCLA by making up words like addressment, which isn't a word. You're at university. Get a fucking dictionary. <laughs> this is a, I, I mean, I think this is the great reveal, right? I mean, we all know this. We all know that these people don't know anything about Gaza. You see these constant videos of like, from what river to what sea? They're like, I don't know, the Mississippi to the Lake Michigan? <laughs> it's like, no, no, the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. They don't know anything about this stuff. And that's obvious. What they are, you know, interested in is cosplaying, is role playing, is doing their, their little two-step and trying to pretend that they're 1968 revolutionaries. Um, the difference, by the way, a slight aside that I noticed is that in the 1968 protests on campus, uh, particularly Columbia, the professors weren't on their side. This is new that the professors are out there standing cheek to jowl with them. But yeah, I mean, when they say like UCLA system was built on colonialism, like that is fantastically incoherent. I mean, I suppose you're saying California or the world. I mean, everything's built on colonialism. And this is, of course, the way that they see Israel, too, as a settler colonialist project. Again, phrases that are the stock phrases of people on the radical left these days. And it seems that most of them don't know what they mean. So it doesn't surprise me that when they're up there, like, they're not thinking about Gaza. I think the other thing, and I, this is the thing that you have to say, and you sound like some kind of crazy uh, John Birch reactionary, but honestly, their issue is with America. I mean, that's always at the end of it. It's America supporting mm -hmm. Israel. It's what America does. It's America's founding. It's everything. And it's always back to being on the other side of the United States of America. You saw, I don't know if you saw this video of the horseshoe theory in action of two people <laughs> across from each other at UCLA saying, fuck Biden. They were chanting oh, at yeah, each we'll other. Play, yeah. We have that. Actually, I mean, let's play it. Let's play it. That, that was a lovely moment of unity, actually. That Kumbaya. one actually made me feel kind of like, you know, there's hope for the future. Hold on. Do we have it ready? Stand by. This is the University of Alabama. Call and response. That's the other, yeah, the country that's the other side place. that chimed in secondly. Uh, this is video from <laughs> Maven Navarro at the Crimson White student newspaper. The Crimson White. I guess there's a Crimson. <laughs> I don't know how it works. <laughs> you can get in trouble with a name like that in the days. <laughs> it's yeah. just the White. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. I just... Uh, I regret the Trump erasure there. Can we just get both of them in all the chance <laughs> for doing this? Erasure. <laughs> Soon I, enough. <laughs> I think that the, the UCLA has been so badly mismanaged, even compared to Columbia, that it's worth mm -hmm. pointing out. And it's it's also that we've lost the plot in America over the last you know five plus years, uh, maybe eight, nine, whatever, about public disorder. Right. Like the, we saw the the clashes, the kind of, you know, gang riot vigilante uh, clashes that happened the night before. Right. On uh, at UCLA, because they had allowed for a long time there to be uh, people squatting on uh, public universities land and uh, uh, and creating a zone where people were not allowed to move freely into campus, shutting down classes effectively, blocking the building of people. When someone's walking through with the Star of David, they're like, you can't come here. Um, they, uh, the campus authorities allowed that for a long time. And what's going to happen when you have a sense of people are threatening or uh, impeding the freedom of other humans and can act with impunity, they're going to be uh, a counter protest there that it's going to become violent and ugly, which is exactly what happened because uh, they lost the idea that you can't have that type of disorder in a public space. Um, it's not, I mean, Joe Biden actually talked about this this morning and it wasn't a great address, 
But the one thing that he said that is right is like speech is fine. Violence is not. It's kind of simple. Um, and there's no way, no reason why you can't act up on that. But UCLA didn't. They acted cowardly and kind of let this thing fester for a long time. And that's going to inevitably lead to this uh, ugliness and uh, and a kind of a, a conflict ridden uh, dispersal of people. Uh, it shouldn't be that hard to uh, outsmart a bunch of half-witted college students. Mm -hmm. I heard the folks at commentary talking yesterday about how the sheer numbers of cops are what kept order. Sending in all those cops at UCLA and Columbia is actually, that's why things didn't get worse than they did. You need more cops, not fewer, to disperse this kind of a situation. And that's actually, that kept the peace because you're having some on the left freak out about why the number of cops, that, you know what? To keep everybody safe, including the cops and the students themselves, they've all been through many, many trainings, especially in New York, and how to disperse a riot or never mind a protest or like this. So trust, I trust the boys in blue. They're not perfect, but here they handled it themselves impeccably and they managed mm -hmm. to break up these protests without too much. Go ahead, Camille. Yeah, I mean, if you don't want to see clouds of tear gas, a legion of rubber bullets <laughs> unleashed on these particular crowds, you're going to need to see a lot of cops individuals down there, in some cases, two and three cops dragging people off, loading them into buses. You're engaged in a political demonstration. You know that you're in breach of perhaps the law, certainly the policy of the university on the campus that you attend to the extent you're a student. You have an expectation that at some point this is going to come to an end. And it may end with your demands being met. More than likely, it's going to end with you having some sort of plastic uh, handcuffs put on your wrist um, and being loaded into a bus and getting processed someplace and maybe spending a couple hours at the at the police precinct. Um, and it, it is important to differentiate between what is acceptable here and what is not. Of course, free speech is a thing. We vehemently support it and endorse it. You can have all of the multisyllabic words that you want and not worry about whether how to define them, whether it's colonialism or intifada. You don't know what these words mean, but you shout them. Same thing with genocide. But what you can't do is set up these encampments on the yard. You cannot become a squatter on your campus and you can't uh, accost people who are just trying to go to class. The fact that Columbia and UCLA and all of these prestigious universities have found themselves completely under siege um, and locked down as a result of these protests, I mean, is damning. And I think it is appropriate to scrutinize the administration and all of these universities. But I think it is imperative that we also just make certain that we are connecting all of this dysfunction with the kind of craziness that we have been talking about on our podcast mm -hmm. for years now. Like the craziness um, of 2020, the craziness of January 6th, and the craziness of what's taking place on campus now, all of it is in important ways part of the same insane political fervor. Um, and at some point, and I think we're starting to see it now, more moderate elements of our politics, the more reasonable um, the people in our in our in our country, the the silent majority, to borrow a phrase, um, are going to have to stand up for themselves and insist that they do not want to to see these kinds of radical demonstrations um, on their campuses. They don't want their politics to be defined by these people who are clearly at the fringe of what most, with respect to what most Americans actually think, whatever you think about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Mm, I'll give uh, Joe Scarborough a nice shout out here because we make fun of that show enough. Um, but he he <laughs> put, put a fine point on it this morning. He had to call MSNBC viewers dumb in order to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I, I give you this statement and let it stand on its own, watch. The riots on college campuses, mm -hmm. can, the riots at the Chicago Convention, all of those things moved my family mm -hmm. from being Democrats their entire life to being Republicans. If you're offended by this, please, I'm trying to help you. I don't want Donald Trump to get elected, all right? There you go. I'm trying to help you. If you're too stupid to figure that out, you change to another <laughs> channel. This is not helping the people of Gaza. And this is not helping uh, those of us who want to fight fascism in America. There's a reason the Reagan revolution took place. The seeds were planted in 1968. Okay, so a lot, a lot of issues with that statement, but mm -hmm. you know, he has to stop yeah. fascism here in America. So we have to stop sure. these protests. That's really what he's saying, but he's not wrong about what a turnoff this is yeah 
to all sane people, Democrat and Republican. No, I mean, he's absolutely right about a few things. I mean, it is absolutely true that the seeds of this were planted. And I would even go further further back and say, like, uh, Mario Silva, the, the people in um, in um, uh, Berkeley, Berkeley in the free speech movement in uh, 1963, which was much calmer, but that was the kind of when it started. And that kind of tumult, and that really changed people. And he's right about that. There's other elements that the Reagan revolution happens in you know late 70s and, of course, 1980 when it really happens. But that said is that, yeah, I mean, this is an own goal in so many ways. And to add, you know, to, to bind these two uh, questions to what Camille was saying before. I mean, we have been talking about this on our show for many, many years, and we believe in the rights of all of these people to be as stupid as possible in as public a way as possible, because this is the great disinfectant to see these halfwits shouting about intifada and then pointing out to their parents and to people listening to this program that the second intifada killed over a thousand Israelis, uh, most of whom were civilians uh, in suicide bombings, et cetera. So you have kids shouting that we would like suicide bombings, I suppose, or they can claim ignorance. I'm glad they have that right. They don't have a right to block people's access. They don't have a right to shut things down. They don't have a right to, you know, deface things and smash windows and shut down the hijack campus. Buildings. I mean, allowed, mm -hmm. Hijack buildings. Hijack buildings. They were not allowed to go to class. So I think the two things here is that Joe Scarborough is right, is that keep going, guys. Keep going, because this is an own goal. You think that he senses the danger for his side and he's right. He knows it, it's, but he's yeah. right. I mean, look at what happened in 2020. This is the racial reckoning. How did that work out? Mm -hmm. Do you think that ultimately benefited Democrats and liberals in a way that people said, you know, this is the direction that I want my country going? These protests, these riots, these things set on fire. Every time I order something from Amazon, it telling me that Ibram X. Kendi is coming to my house to deliver it. <laughs> I mean, there's like, I don't need this all the time. And I, I love looking at the stupidity. And I want to add one final thing, Megan. You showed a, a clip there. And I was bleary eyed in bed this morning and I read this. So when I saw the clip of it saying, we go to school, the, you cut it off at a key point. Because I want to read you the whole clip because I want to make sure that people understand how smart kids in our Ivy League are who says, you know, this is a fucking school. It's a fucking school. What are you doing? This is a school. We fucking learned the final sentence. I got to learn about public health. That's <laughs> <literally, laughs> According to the Daily Mail, look it up. That must be true. He's screaming at the NYPD, I got to learn about public health. Oh my it's God. like the fact that he didn't get a baton across the face says a lot about the NYPD. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Can I L ask one thing? No, but, no, wait. Oh, oh, LAPD, the thing. whatever. So, <laughs> so they're all out there and, you know, they're, yeah. you heard the woman in the opening clip about UCLA saying this is founded on violent colonialism and therefore it's an inherently violent institution. And that's really our ultimate goal here. Don't worry. If you are at UCLA or perhaps the sponsor of the university or a taxpayer, I guess if you're in uh, California, you're a taxpayer there um, of the university, fear not. Because these protesters uh, at UCLA and elsewhere, to be honest, uh, they are not to be feared because we've seen what they need in order to just maintain their two day encampment. And you can't make it up. It's, I've seen the full list now. I'd heard the highlights, but this is the full list. Okay, Fox's Bill Malugin got it and posted it on X. <laughs> All right, here, the sampling that we've seen already in the media, I'll read. Uh, they are demanding, now they've been dispersed, but were demanding as of 24 hours ago, vegan and gluten-free food, super bright flashlights with strobe. Sure, I'm sure the cops would love to see that brought in. Rope and zip ties, no problem. I'm sure that's for completely upstanding learning purposes. Helmets, shields, and wood. Lotion. Mm. Oh. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no sunscreen. Tissues. Absolutely. <laughs> a little, you know, DVD with with a player. <laughs> no no sunscreen. They're music. really, they're feeling really, really strongly about no sunscreen. That's capital N, capital O. Mm. Knee and elbow mm. pads. I refer you back to the lotion. And Oops. above all, no bananas. <laughs> no bananas whatsoever. Again, the lotion. Yeah. <laughs> but you, <laughs> I missed that one morning. <laughs> okay, so now, hold on. Now this is where you get the fine print. I'm going to bring up my reading glasses to read the fine, fine print. Oh, here okay, oh, here here's some goes. more. Gas masks and respirators. Sure, no problem. What could possibly go mm. wrong? Um, utility gloves especially for small hands, lotion, <laughs> is, 
EpiPens and non-steroid inhalers. I mean, obviously yeah. this group is going to be riddled with all sorts of issues. Mm. <laughs> is anyone surprised? Yeah. Um, they, are, of course, know nuts because of all the allergies that these EpiPen and non-steroid inhaler people are suffering from. Rope, zip ties I mentioned, and on it goes. So I feel like we're going to survive because it sounds like these people are too busy with their like rashes and allergic reactions mm -hmm. and whatever they're doing with the knee pads and the lotion to really attack and take down UCLA. But what do you guys think? Uh, the I mean, it sounds like they're going under into a tunnel for six months. I mean, <laughs> they're, trying, they're, trying to, <laughs> they're trying to be Hamas. It's amazing. I don't think the Hamas guys are like, you know, no nuts. It's very tight quarters. <laughs> you know, I don't think that's happening. But yeah, this is, uh, I, I will. Uh, Matt, is Hamas I don't want to cut Russian? <laughs> Uh, it's, it's Triumph the Insult Comic Dog, I apparently. That's are all one hand accents. Okay, but yeah. can we discuss the no bananas? Yes, we have no bananas. Because, yes. uh, like, who's got such a severe banana? Okay, but whatever. If you I are so severely allergic who. to bananas that you have to issue warnings to people, not, not to, then don't show up at the damn protest, okay? Yeah, this is true. <laughs> uh, I, Number one, I say this go ahead. with a, a 15 year old who has a severe hazelnut allergy, and if she was camping out for the intifada i suppose i would oh, no. want them to not throw hazelnuts and nutella at her face but um also <laughs> she might not do that and she would have brought her EpiPen because even she's not a moron um but uh, there is somebody like uh we talked about this on, on uh, an episode and on our comments someone says i'm the person who has the severe banana allergy and i've gone into anaphylaxis or whatever it's called uh, because of it shock yeah anaphylactic shock uh, in the past so it does exist <laughs> it's anaphylactic, um, but again, there's a there's a real great way to avoid uh, going into bananaphylactic shock at mm -hmm. your uh, Hamas encampment outside of Sproul Hall, um, which is maybe don't do that. Um, and, uh, and 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 not for nothing, it. don't call attention to the fact that you're allergic to bananas because yeah, what happened was... next was entirely <laughs> predictable. And now the they're best. also claiming additional victimization because what happened was. The, the pro-Israel counter-protesters came, look, waving bananas, yeah. <laughs> waving mean. bananas um, all over. The <laughs> security guy turns around. He yeah, takes it's, a it's, blow what is happening? Like, to laugh yeah, back. it's great. <laughs> it's great. The, the thing bananas, that we'll we learn about in this war is something we always knew is that Jews are funny. So, you know, <laughs> they're going to bring bananas to the protest because they're a funny people. After that much torture for so many years, they become very funny. So. As Iowa Hawk pointed out, like, don't. Don't bring your uh, banana allergy to a fight against the people who invented comedy. That's just, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not going to work. Yeah, that's right. they're, they're, Protesters do, do such a disservice to the people who they are ostensibly pro pro protesting in, in support of. The, the fact that so many of these people would describe themselves of an, as anti-war while they are unfurling banners with the word intifada scrawled yeah, yeah. in red on it yeah, is, is just so... Insane to me. I, it I depends on who's doing all the dying, these, Camille. But I'm I'm convinced that most of these people don't actually know what it is that they are in support of. They certainly don't know what they're demonstrating for. Like we've seen that over and over again. But that said, it is hard not to regard you as inherently dangerous when you you insist on describing everything in the most insane kind of with the most insane maximalist condemnations, and then you use language like that frivolously consistently it is it is maddening it's really hard to de to determine when we're looking at someone who is just a, a blinkered idiot who is obviously misled and someone who is a genuine bona fide anti-semite it is hard mm -hmm. to disentangle that in this particular moment um, no, and you're, you're not right. making it any easier we have I, 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 we have reason to believe there may be terrorist affiliated people in these protests and also helping organize around these protests. I'll get to that in just a bit. And then there are the morons who I don't want to leave just yet. Okay, I want to stay with me. Let's just stay on the morons for, for another minute before we get to the truly nefarious ones. Um, we showed some of this video, but here is this woman who her name is unfortunately Johanna King Slutsky. And oh, no. she's <laughs> at, I know, it's sad, sorry. That's what made her so bitter. 
I mean, that's, you can see it. Like, <laughs> I mean, it, it if could be a great name. If last name is Letsky, if you really run with it. <laughs> change it. Like Smith is More fine. Has suggestions. Yeah. Yeah, I have like, suggestions. Why, why don't you stick with yeah. that? I mean, frankly, I don't understand the last name Cox either. I don't, you know, Dick is also bad. I, I'm sorry, but it, they are. Anywho, Slutsky is over at, and by the way, it's hyphenated. So she could have just gone with Johanna King. Mm -hmm. That's not bad. Who's like, I'll mm, keep yeah. the hyphen Slutsky. <laughs> You're really trying to send a message. Anywho, there she is at Columbia in, enacting her bitterness live in front of the camera for us all. She's one of the leaders. And you, you may have seen this the other day, but she was demanding that they be allowed to ferret up food and other supplies to the people who had overtaken this hall, Hamilton Hall. And these are the terms that she described it in. Take a listen to SOP 4. Why should the university be steps? obligated to provide food to people who've taken over a building? Uh, well, for, first of all, we're saying that they're obligated to provide food to students who pay for a meal plan here. But you mentioned that there was a request to, that food and water be brought in, unless I misunderstood. To allow it to be brought in. I mean, well, I guess it's ultimately a question of what kind of community and obligation Columbia feels it has to its students. Um, do you want students to die of dehydration and starvation or get severely <laughs> ill, even if they disagree with you? If the answer is no, then you should allow basic, I mean, it's crazy to say because we're on an Ivy League campus, but this is like basic humanitarian aid we're asking for. Like, could people please what? have a glass of water? But they, they, they did put themselves in that very deliberately. <laughs> they have water fountains. Situation and in that position. So it, it seems like you're sort of saying, we want to be revolutionaries. We want to take up this building. Now, would you please bring us food and water? And Nobody's asking them to bring anything. Every, we're, we're asking them to not violently stop <laughs> us from bringing in basic in humanitarian aid. Without They're sound. The I, we are looking for a commitment from them that they will not stop oh, it but violently. they haven't stopped it yet. We, well, I don't, I'm not, I don't know to what extent it has been attempted, but we're looking for a commitment. And Those See, four children. I told you. <laughs> oh my God, Miss Slutsky. Uh, what have you Thanks, wrought? Slutsky. Can someone also point out finally that behind her there is a the guy with like a yes. half shirt on yeah. who we clearly would be you, thrown Money off Hand. a building in Gus? We have a screen close up of the guy behind her just for you. Do I know yes. my fifth column yes. men or do I not? Yes. Look at this guy. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, uh, what a that, tragedy. It I, there's, for the listening that. audience, I mean, you can see full midriff and belly button of this yeah. Hamas-supporting I mean, gentleman. So sad. That's, that's what like, Hamas America's wears in the battlefield. Great. That's truly, what. That's their truly, uniform. Truly disadvantaged. He's shopping at Zara Kids <laughs> to buy his clothes. It just it doesn't fit at all. This is not oh, a fashion statement. Yeah. This is a man in desperate need. Actually, Camille, seeing that him may the, change my view of the whole thing. Hard disagree. I mean, hard disagree. <laughs> yeah. America wins again. He might be again. special. I, unclear. The midriff but let intifada. Me get you, so, so, Johanna. Uh, <laughs> look at those that. eyebrows. Wow. Yeah. 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 It's <laughs> unbelievable. Show me the country where that dude gets to do this. Wow. That yeah. country right. ain't Gaza. No. <laughs> no. no. He did hear that Iran off is offering yeah. scholarships to students who find they themselves are. expelled. I'm sure that they would welcome him with that would open be awesome. arms. Yes, they That's would. That's right. Open. I'm sure. Would. Arms. Those arms would, would cinch around, around him in a very him tight him embrace. Off the building he'd go. <laughs> no. Megan, so, one, one of the reasons why uh, that they asked for zip ties in UCLA, I don't know if you saw some of the footage of the students uh, trying to uh, put their plywood back up the other night. Um, they kind of didn't know how to do it. They were yes, using right. zip ties <laughs> to try to lash together <laughs> plywood fortresses. Um, yeah, there's not there's uh, not a man, lot man, of these uh, are, construction. These are all um, like union guys. These are all like they're doing <laughs> sure, their PhDs. Yeah. And Salt I'll tell you what, I, I'm going to read you a sentence because Miss Slutsky mm -hmm. is, of course, in a PhD program. And yes. this is what America, this is what we're paying, $90,000 a year for this because we need this this is exactly what we have particularly with inflation and recession and stuff. student loan my forgiveness goal, now yeah and this is her about her own phd dissertation my goal is to write a prehistory of metabolic rift marx's yes. term for the disruption of energy circuits caused by the industrialization uh, industrialization under capitalism so this is right i mean miss Letsky has so many skills and um who didn't you know, again, do that I, it doesn't surprise me that she doesn't know how to get food so. yeah no no so listen so she's so wonderful. I love her introduction as a character in this story. I yeah. pray to God above for, and thank him for taking care of us this way. Um, 
We don't know who put this together, but my crack producers, Debbie, Canadian Debbie, found online a parody video that's been produced of Johanna King Slutsky. Even I have not yet seen it. Let's let's watch it together, shall we? Basically, we would like to get some pepperoni pizzas. Just make sure they are gluten free or you know what? Just sounds like you just want pizza with no bread. Is that what you're saying? Just send some pizzas without bread. OK. Oh, and also no cheese. Um, many of us are allergic to cheese. And while you're at it, please make sure there is no tomato sauce. It looks like blood and we don't want to trigger anybody. So just just send us some plant based pepperoni in a box. And if they don't have vegan pepperoni, just just send us some pizza boxes with napkins and shit. Just make sure the pizza box is made with recycled cardboard. And if they don't have any recycled pizza boxes? If not, just uh, just don't send us anything. We'll just go back home to mommy. Thank you. <laughs> Almost impossible to parody these people. It's hard, yeah. Almost Who impossible. Who says AI is dangerous? It's the best thing that ever happened to America. <laughs> So I do want to stay on her. She's she really is a gift, this gal. So yeah. we also took a look at her at, at her story. And um, by the way, before I move on from the parody, Eve Barlow, who's a journalist on Substack titled Blacklisted, writes the following. Can we please get an airdrop at Columbia University? We need 900 acai bowls, 1,300 impossible <laughs> burgers on gluten-free bread with sugar-free vegan ketchup, and 3,000 bottles of pH 9.0 electrolyte water. This is urgent at UNRWA, the UN <laughs> Emergency <laughs> Services. Exactly right. So this gal, Johanna, is listed on Columbia's website as an instructor and PhD student, although... We tried to click on her bio from the school and it now says we cannot find the page. So we don't know whether mm. Johanna, you know, she, it's possible she received a little backlash from that nonsense. She's per currently getting her PhD in English and comparative literature. And picking up on what you were saying, Moynihan, her bio on Columbia's web website when it was posted said her research interests include romanticism, transcendentalism, Marxism, science and literature, environmental humanities, eco-criticism, and 18th and 19th century poetics. What? Mm. I only understood every Ooh. other word. Well, that's fine. That's yeah, like, yeah, I, I mean, like that. A pretty decent I like transcendentalism. Though. I'm an Emerson. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm from Concord, yeah. Massachusetts. I'm an Emerson fan. You, but <laughs> you would like you it. You have to say I've, yeah, go ahead. Yes, I, I love Miss Slutsky. Every, you know, Officer Slutsky. Uh, <laughs> or this Krupsky, sorry. Speaking of um, lotion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the incredible thing about this is that if she hadn't put herself out there, we look at this stuff and we say, oh my God, how much nonsense can you squeeze into into one human? And it's like, <laughs> she's just representative of, of thousands of people on campus. I mean, everybody who is doing a PhD is kind of in that universe. The, there's a great uh, contest. I don't know if it's still, um, they still do it. It used to be a guy named Dennis Dutton did it, but a bad writing contest of uh, academic papers. And it's just completely incoherent because there are people who believe that they can mask their stupidity with incoherence and people will think they're just being smart and they don't get it. And that's the kind of stuff when you're trying to read what her PhD dissertation is about. But it's funny because you see her in this situation and the one thing that you have to, we laugh at this stuff because it's ridiculous, absurd and funny and it undermines everything they're trying to do. But notice what they are doing. She's trying to pretend that she's a Gazan. We need humanitarian aid. She literally mm -hmm. said humanitarian aid. People mm -hmm. are going she to did. starve to death. They're going to starve. be uh, uh, thirsty. Insane. I mean, it's like this kind of stuff is like they're cosplaying and they don't, they've never been to Gaza. Obviously, they know nothing about this. They've probably never been to Israel. I don't know. I mean, Miss Slutsky maybe did uh, Alia, I did uh, Birthright at some point. Who knows? But this is the, the thing that happens is you say, we're playing the role of these people. We need humanitarian aid because the Gazans, which by the way, is very, very insulting to Gazans. I mean, whatever you think about this war, and I think we've made very clear, well, I have anyway, of what I think about it on this show. But, you know, the people of Gaza are bearing the brunt of this. And that's because Hamas doesn't give a shit about them. And so I have an enormous amount of sympathy for those people because there are people there that are really opposed to Hamas and have no outlet to actually be opposed to them. And then you have a bunch of spoiled $90,000 a year college students who could just order fucking Grubhub saying that they might starve to death on campus. I mean, it reminds How me of- How are they supposed to get water, Michael? 
I don't. I, the, the, the pipes are are very old in those buildings, Megan. They might kill them. They're from 1890. <laughs> What am I supposed to do with that thing? You know what happened during the 50s with the water fountain? It's very triggering. <laughs> People had separate water fountains. <laughs> right. Now you want us to use a water fountain. Okay, Bull Connor. <laughs> <laughs> so listen it's, to this. So she, she then went on, okay, to speak, and she wanted people to not have her name. All right, she refused to give her name. Um, mm. Of course, we figured it out. But she did want you to know that her pronouns are she, her. Okay, because- like the gentleman with the midriff exposed behind her, she's very pro LGBTQ and also mm -hmm. pro Hamas. It can happen. Mm -hmm. And um, she added the following less life lessons, which is you know helpful. She's getting her PhD. She must be super smart and elite. Let's take a listen. Mm -hmm. Are there any plans to demonstrate a graduation? Or it's really bizarre to us and perhaps to members of the public to see so much concern over graduation when we're in the middle of a genocide. I think you have to really look at what's important here. We are on stolen land from indigenous people and the land of Jeez. people who were displaced from Harlem. We recognize that we have a shared fight. Um, and when we say things like from the river to the sea or open the gates, it's in recognition of the shared fight that unites people at Columbia University, the people in Palestine and people in Harlem. I mean, <laughs> unbelievable. Fuck you. If, if I truly believed Sorry. I was somehow indirectly a party to some sort of crime, if it was important enough for me to talk about ad nauseum, I would do something about it. I probably wouldn't go to that school. I wouldn't I wouldn't be a partake of that. I wouldn't have the affiliation. I wouldn't be I wouldn't pay them my money. I would do something about it. But they never do something about it. These land acknowledgments, this constant berating of everyone about all of the abuses that that are somehow had been perpetrated at some point in history, which now need to be accounted for by someone other than me, the person who is literally apparently a part of the crime. It's just so insanely heinous. Um, and, and the appropriation of the suffering, one hand, is just kind of ringing in my ear as, as well. Like the, the notion of imagining yourselves as the central player in all of this, the actual victim, while you're talking about genocide, is, is just heinous in the extreme. There's but, a, and also now is Harlem's struggle. There. It's also Harlem's yeah, I mean, struggle. It's, it's same. Harlem, sure, yeah. but From the Harlem River to the there. Atlantic. The, from, the yeah, from, from the East River to the Hudson. Um, <laughs> but notice what she, she does there oh. in this thing. You know, uh, it's like it is about them. Right. We are starving. You have to pay attention. To Clearly us, takes, takes the focus away. But she that this is the, the, the unbelievable this movement of hypocrisy and double standard. She's standing in front of a bank of microphones saying, why are you paying attention to us? Yes. And there's a genocide <laughs> going. Yeah. Get away from the fucking microphones because yeah. you know, <laughs> you're there. Don't be there. <laughs> Leave and do a land acknowledgement and give all your money to the to the local tribe. Do so it. Don't Napa who you were. Happily take do it. it. Oh, Everyone Bernie ignored you Sanders. up until two minutes ago. Yes. Bernie Sanders yesterday gave a big speech on the Senate floor, and I won't do the Bernie Sanders impersonation because Moynihan's is better. But um, <laughs> in which he's like, you know, looks to an end. Um, why, why are you paying attention to yeah. all these college students when you should be paying attention to the people of Gaza and their suffering? And I agree. I mean, I think CNN does pay attention to the people of Gaza and their suffering. Um, but uh, that's a weird thing. That's a weird flex for protesters to be saying, we're here protesting. Why are you paying attention to us protesting here? What are you doing exactly? <laughs> and um, and then, I mean, also, it's not really getting that much direct uh, attention as much as it probably should. But what are they actually asking for in these places? Um, uh, always the list is we need to stop down this university having any exchange with anybody in Israel. That's strange. I mean, mm -hmm. that's not really the traditional uh, uh, purpose of a research university is to close off exchange with an entire country and to make this one country the one like was Saudi Arabia fine? Like what's what what is the sliding scale? Is, you know, yeah. uh, that, that we're how about uh, China? Applying? Uh, about red china um you know there's there's a, a whole about bunch them of different Uyghurs. things mm -hmm. and like to get you know we we want our endowment funds to not invest in companies that do business with companies in israel um there's a history of divestment efforts um and whether they work and whether they don't and usually they don't sanctions and targeted sanctions usually don't the one big exception both in the sanctions literature and in the <laughs> student protest divestment literature is against um the uc university of california 
uh, and also Columbia University did this too, uh, they divested from their holdings that had to do with apartheid South Africa in the 1980s. And there's some literature to suggest that stuff uh, worked. Maybe not the university side, but uh, the uh, kind of global revulsion at the apartheid regime, which was righteous. Uh, and uh, it had cause, and I think it had some effect, as did the end of the Cold War, uh, with the end of the apartheid regime. It's nice. Um, but what the students are asking for in many and most cases seem odd. And if you subjected them like to, I don't know, a simple vote in, in America, not that you should subject everything to that test, it would be thunderously rejected by people because it sounds crazy. A lot of it also has to do with like we can't have cops anymore unless, of course, we're getting targeted yeah. by the other side. Um, yeah. It's a whole rag bag of kind of leftist um, dream projects that are not going to come to pass. And there's this weird sense from you see from Columbia professors as well of like uh, trying to overly uh, ennoble these kids like they're really mm. doing something i i appreciate i honestly do i appreciate people who look at the rubble in gaza and see one side of a civilian population just getting uh hammered right now as they are um and and feeling sympathy for that and mm -hmm. and, and and protesting in public about it i think that's a pretty humanistic impulse uh but that's not the only thing that's going on mm, you're so right about I, the I, cops too they because they get lumped in in a lot of these discussions they want of course they want all cops gone these are big pro defunder of the police groups. And there was a certain justice to watching uh, the cops go in. This is NYPD body cam video. I'm gonna show you the whole thing of breaking down the Columbia encampment in Hamilton Hall. They were professional and they were no nonsense. And unlike the administrators, they were not a bunch of coddlers. There was no pr police brutality that we've seen in any of these, nor even in any allegation of, of it. But take a look at the cops going in and, and reclaiming Hamilton Hall. The students are, are fighting, trying to. The students are holding up these big wooden shields that they've made. They're, they're not complying. Some are sitting quietly. Some are sitting yelling, free Palestine. The cops are trying to, to disperse them and keep order. They've got barricades up. It's unbelievable that these kids, kids, that these university students think this is fine. We're allowed to do this. We're here to learn. And you just really need to sit back and any show of police force is offensive to me on this stolen land, you colonizers. I mean, that's, how did they get this way? I really like, I know we all cover this, but like these kids are what, 22? How the mm. hell is this just, this what, what would have happened to my kids had I let them stay in the New York City schools? Like, how do you get this demented? No. I mean, how you get this demented is, you know, evidenced by the number of Columbia professors that are standing uh, beside them and is sending letters to the administration saying you have to let these kids break the law. Um, you know, the amazing thing is that, you know, the the disconnect that these kids have from all of this stuff, the hypocrisy. I mean, we talk about queers for Palestine and gay people saying, you know, I support the Houthis and what they're doing in, in you know, the Middle East, et cetera, when the Houthis just sentenced, I think, eight or nine uh, men to stoning to death uh, for crimes of homosexuality. But they're also, you see this in the police camera vid uh, videos. Uh, the, New the New York Police Department is a majority minority police force. It is over 50% minority. Funny to say over 50% minority, but that's where we are in America. <laughs> majority minority police force. They're working class. They do not make a ton of money. They put themselves in danger every day. And, you know, these are the kids that are coddled. $90,000 a year, worried about getting their meal plan. And they're talking about Marx. I mean, this has always been a, a, a thing that has been funny to look at. I mean, there was a famous joke about the 68 convention of the, you know, the, the student getting on his knees and saying, long live the dictatorship of the proletariat and the police officer cracking him on the head with his baton and saying, I am the proletariat. Mm -hmm. There is something to that because mm -hmm. if you see these spoiled kids, that is the juxtaposition that most people see. They see cops who have a really tough job. And you know what? You don't get a special, a special dispensation when you're breaking the law because you have politics that you think are right. 
It doesn't, there's no carve outs in the law that if there is a quote unquote genocide happening, which there is not, you know, this is, this is okay. You can, you can trash a building. It's not even sitting in the building. You're breaking the windows. There were January mm -hmm. 6th vibes when you saw those mm -hmm. kids with the hammers breaking the glass. For what reason? I don't know. But it was, I suppose they were trying to show a message about their strength, but they look stupid, hypocritical, and weak. And the guys yeah. who are actually earning their living and going out there and actually doing their job, they're waiting desperately for one of them to get mad, which you would kind of understand because these guys have tough jobs and these spoiled little brats are making them even harder. They should be up doing real crimes. And maybe one of them will flip him over in his back in a moment of anger. And then now we get that video. And then we have three days of media coverage about it. It's a yeah. tough job for them. And these, mm -hmm. these kids are spoiled brats and they should all be ashamed of themselves. And most of them should be kicked out of school. The cops are going in there. They, they know these kids have called for zip ties and strobe lights and gas masks. Then they walk in. It's complete disarray. They've barricaded the doors and they've got large wooden shields that they've, a, a lot of them helmets. had, not to mention all those yeah. helmets we saw. What are the cops, like, they behave perfectly appropriately, but this is just to show you, like, this isn't about protest as part of an American tradition and we protect free mm -hmm. speech, whether it's on campus mm -hmm. or on. This is not that, just stop it. This is nonsense. These are spoiled, entitled brats and they got what was coming to them. My only question is whether DA Alvin Bragg will actually follow through with any sort of a prosecution. But okay, I wanna just go back, back to this one point because we've, we've touched on it a couple times, but it bears underscoring what these people actually are supporting, right? You mentioned what the Houthis do. You don't have to go that far, of course. You just go to Palestine. You just go and figure out how does Hamas feel, how do the Palestinians feel about homosexuals, all right? Because again, this woman, she, her, surrounded by, by man in the midriff with his belly button hanging out, um, they may not know that it's not just uh, Hamas, okay? Because according to Pew Research, 93% of the Palestinian population is completely opposed to homosexuality. That's among the highest in the world. According to Palestinian law, being gay is punishable by up to 10 years in prison. In Gaza, it's punishable by a bullet in your brain. You get killed if you're gay in Gaza, okay? Um, and it's also been named by Forbes as one of the worst countries in the world for LGBTQ travelers. So don't travel to Palestine, Mr. Midriff or Miss Sheher. And just to further underscore it, we cut this soundbite. Uh, via memory uh, in 2022. This is the, a Palestinian Islamic scholar, Sheikh Yusuf Abu Islam, on what should happen to gays in Palestine. Watch. Allah punished male and female adulterers only with flogging or stoning. But when he decided to punish homosexuals, he said that they should be thrown head first from the rooftop of the tallest building, and then they should be stoned from the top. Free, free Palestine. <laughs> Here's my belly button in my rainbow colored outfit. I mean, are they just clueless? Like, truly, like, why are the gays protesting in favor of Palestine? It's legit, like, I don't know whether this man's gay. Uh, he looks gay to me, but why? It's hot. <laughs> uh, I I think it's it's a, a useful exercise to try to steal man as much as possible in between also making uh, hilarious fun out of everybody, um, <laughs> which is to say that I think that people work backwards from power. They're in mm -hmm. America, so they are, as Michael said earlier, uh, they are interested in the exercise of American power and American sins and American colonialism and settler whatever isms um, that America has in its past. They perceive that in this uh, fight, they're kind of not wrong about this, that Israel has power and people in Gaza have much less power. Um, and so all other considerations can be subsumed under that. They, they rank lower uh, in the hierarchy of needs of things that they need to get mad about. So they see Israel as backed by the U.S. and the U.S. is basically enabling genocide on their watch and they feel really bad about it. And so they're kind of going to look the other way about the sources and methods. Maybe they will occasionally try to uh, fact check the number of rapes and was it really a rape and whatever. But for the most part, they're focused on the exercise of power of these two countries and they are monomaniacally kind of focused on this. And there's a whole school of thought at Columbia, within the State Department, among younger people and Democrats in particular, that this 
um, this sort of connection, the U.S. supporting Israel and Israel's policies are what is the problem with the global affairs and American foreign policy writ large. No, but like, and so that's what they're paying attention. You think in the same way people vote in their own best interest when it comes to presidential elections here in the States, why wouldn't you be saying, I'm not so in favor of the throwing the gays off the rooftops? Like, it, it has to be sheer ignorance. You know what they need to do? They need to read Reason Magazine, where Matt okay. Welsh publishes, um, in 2016, according to Reason, from October of 23, Hamas militants executed one of their own commanders, very beloved guy, for allegedly having sex with another man. Not even his loyalty could save him. They executed him with three bullets to the chest, reportedly tortured him first by whipping him, hanging him from a ceiling for hours, and cranking loud music into his cell in order to deprive him of sleep. In 2022, in the West Bank, 25-year-old Ahmed Abu Maria's severed head was found on the west side of the road after he was murdered for being gay. The killer, just in case you were wondering if I'm BSing you, or reason is, videotaped the execution and shared it on social media. Let that marinate while we take a quick break and so much more with the fifth column on the other side of this. Do you owe back taxes? Pandemic relief is now over. Along with hiring thousands of new agents and field officers, the IRS has kicked off 2024 by sending over 5 million pay-up letters to those who have unfiled tax returns or balances owed. Don't waive your rights and speak with them on your own. Tax Network USA, a trusted tax relief firm, can help you. They've saved over $1 billion in back taxes for their clients, and they can help you secure the best deal possible. Whether you owe 10,000 bucks or 10 million, they can help you. Whether it's business or personal taxes, even if you have the means to pay, or if you're on a fixed income, they can help finally resolve your tax burdens once and for all. Call 1-800-245-6000 for a private, free consultation, or just visit tnusa.com slash Megan. All right, so let's spend a minute on who may be infiltrating these protests. And we know that the George Soros's of the world are helping fund them and spread them and get tents and so on. Um, to these kids on these campuses across America. But there is a question of what exactly, what kind of element has infiltrated them and why. Uh, the, the report I just mentioned about the wife of a terrorist at Columbia has been out there for a couple of days now. There was this guy, our audience may remember him. His name is Sammy al Arian, and he went on Fox News like right after 9-11. You guys remember this? Yeah, in, yeah in, Bill O'Reilly. It was yeah. right, exactly. With Bill O'Reilly in 2001, right after 9-11. And O'Reilly, we, we, we tried to find a clip, but we couldn't find one because I don't know why. We're, we're, we continue to look. But O'Reilly got in his grill and really said, you should be in custody and uh, something like that. Anyway, ultimately he was. He was charged by uh, then Attorney General John Ashcroft, indicted on terrorism charges and wound up pleading guilty uh, on a charge of conspiracy to make or receive contributions of funds, goods, or services to or for the benefit of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, he was deported from the United States. So why was his wife, Nala, uh, seen at the Columbia encampment, at least according to reports? Um, this guy, by the way, Samuel Arian, was a former professor at the University of South Florida and an activist uh, and and so th there's a real question about why this man, this terrorist who was deported from the United States, his wife at least was seen at the Columbia encampment. That's disturbing enough. And then we get a report today of, okay, this is on X and it's a quote, safety alert. All right, the user reports as following encampments being eyed by Hamas for use as terror hubs. This is unconfirmed by us, but this person is quoting from the documents themselves that um, she's posted. Today, the Hamas-run resistance movement issued a PDF, quote, flood the gates, escalate, end quote. With directives to over 100 U.S. college encampments, they have mapped out in an interactive website, which she posts, and you can click on if you go to it. These foreign accounts previously published atrocities on 10-7 as victories and daily attacks around Gaza against Israelis by their, quote, comrades in Hamas and Hezbollah. So the posters are very sympathetic and pro-Hamas. For two weeks, they published daily updates of U.S. student encampments. Encampments today in their PDF, uh, they're distributing it to encampment leaders through pro 
Palestinian organizers and charities, uh, which they quote in a post as asking for escalation trainings. And screenshots from the PDF include quotes as follows. Break open university gates. Quote, your first task is to open campus to the community and reject the distinction between students and outside agitators. Second, above all else, escalate. Power won't move unless we strike fear in the heart of the ruling class and pose a threat to their reproduction of capital. Three, build more militancy. Diversity of tactics only works if we are building more militancy. It's time for more of us to step up to the front line. Four, bring the war home. Image of the Atlanta police and the Israeli defense forces. Additional quotes, we will not disavow any actions taken to escalate, including militant direct actions. We keep us safe by escalating. Don't hesitate to take more risk. The pro-Palestinian movement must be a movement against the police. We must no longer cry foul at the bullying of the pigs and stop appealing to respectability of monsters. There exists a dialectical relationship between the underground and above ground. We are in the U.S. We in the U.S. are not exempt from resistance. It is insincere to glorify the Palestinian resistance if we do not raise our own resistance here. And on it goes. Finally, there's we are not naive enough to think revolution will come through peaceful means. Um, again, just on the background, this is a person who has been following these accounts. She goes by um, Stephanie, uh, at Stephanie Vox on a line. And she is not purporting to be, you know, the AP or Reuters. She's just somebody who monitors the accounts and has posted them for you to click on and interact with yourself. And I had my team go and try to make sure this wasn't some hoax. This wasn't somebody just trying to make them look more dangerous than they are. And as far as we can tell, this is actually a group that's done the things that she is suggesting they've done. This all leads me to Joe Biden's current push to bring so-called refugees from Gaza here to America. Uh, this was unveiled the other day. According to CBS News, they've seen internal federal documents that indicate the Biden administration is considering bringing some Palestinians to the United States as, quote, refugees. Documents show senior officials across several federal U.S. agencies discussing the practicality of different options to resettle Palestinians from Gaza who have immediate family members who are American citizens or permanent residents. All of this, everything I just listed, right? The terrorist wife at, reportedly at Columbia, this, we have to escalate, you know, confront the cops. You don't have to stay lawful. Um, and then more of an influx of people from Palestine mean Joe Biden's gonna lose the election. Honestly, like if he brings Palestinian, quote, refugees into America in the face of all this, uh, Trump could win in a Reagan-esque landslide, landslide. Like, I don't think he can do this as a practical matter. And I actually have real concerns already about who's infiltrating the protests because they're all over it. So now we talk about the biggest universities, but these are happening from campus to campus across America right now. We have another month at least of this before the colleges go, you know, away for the summer. And I, for one, am legit concerned about who may be exploiting all of this and what's What's about to happen? What's, what's the next shoe to fall? For me, it's less about worrying about terrorists' wives um, and, uh, and who may be trying to exploit it. I mean, uh, we spent the first half of this show looking at people calling for humanitarian aid drops of bottled water to their LARPing um, little uh, demonstrations in Colombia. Uh, I don't think that you see at these demonstrations hardcore organized terrorists. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of people trying, um, that there's some elements out there trying. Um, but I, I've also uh, have had material worry since 9-11 about that word, actually material, right? I, a lot of people have been prosecuted for providing, quote unquote, material support for terrorist organizations. Sometimes that includes lawyers, dirtbag lawyers, <laughs> absolutely dirtbag lawyers in particular, um, but i that's not terrorism. Um, and I think that you have to be able to separate out those threats and have a little bit of confidence. Another thing to have confidence in, or not confidence, but to be aware of, let's say, is that FBI is all over this stuff. Um, Counterterrorism lives in New York City in particular, 
But in general, uh, the FBI spends a lot of time um, infiltrating those types of groups and actually hatching plots that maybe people aren't really all that into anyways. There's been a lot of entrapment with a, with a kidnapping case with uh, Gretchen Whitmer. So I am more confident than you are, Megan. I don't think that there is a big revolutionary fervor. You can try to do intifada in America, and I wouldn't be surprised if there is some, uh, at least one act of, of attempted terrorism that we'll see before the election, partly because of what we talked about before. We have been getting more political violence in this country, and we have not talked through it sensibly. We've been having this mismatch of an idea that words are violence, but violence are somehow speech. Um, mm -hmm. It's like, what are you even talking about? It doesn't make any sense. If we focus on the actual violence as opposed to the incendiary rhetoric, and we focus on actual planning uh, instead of you know PDF files that may or may not have a lot of direct influence on what's happening on the campuses, I have some faith that we will be okay. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think there will be big attempts to disrupt the Chicago Democratic Convention, and also all of those uh, attempts will be have to take place five miles from the actual convention because uh, we've all covered the conventions in the past, and they basically create a militarized perimeter uh, around the thing. So, um, yes, I, I hope worrisome. they cross right into the south side of Chicago. See how that goes. Um, I mean, oh, so, some will emanate from there. I wouldn't be surprised. Seriously. If you, I mean, like I've been there and I've interviewed <laughs> folks there and it is the, to the point where one gang controls one neighborhood and another opposing gang controls the very next neighboring block and you're mm -hmm. not allowed to cross over. Try doing it as an Upper West Side white liberal lady wearing a cafe. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll look forward to watching that. Good luck, sister. Mm. You know, I have to say that, and this is the kind of the the bit where you have three essential civil libertarians on talking about this stuff. But you know, I don't worry about terrorism developing in that those camps. I mean, the exploitation of it is exactly what they want, and it's the best thing for them to do. I mean, and and by them, I mean that coalition of psychopaths that um, support Hamas. And we've seen this, and you can go out and look at this. And there's a lot of this stuff out there, particularly at Memory, who you quoted earlier the Middle East Media Research Institute. Um, they translate stuff. And, you know, Iranian leaders, uh, Palestinian leaders from the PA and Hamas and the West Bank and Gaza um, across the region saying, you know, keep it up, students. We're, you know, and it, you know, that buoys them. And that's the best they can hope for, right, is that people who are in the process of negotiating in Egypt with Israel about hostage releases, seeing this stuff and getting the impression that the entire world is on their side. And they don't really have to give an inch because the world is turning against Israel the yeah. longer they wait. And that is the best thing for them. I mean, I don't worry about the terrorist infiltration or whatever. I, think that's not, I don't think that's going to happen. I think that there are extremism is what I have to worry about in just a sort of broad ideological way is that the center has shifted so much that Overton window has moved. You have a thing like there's a group called People's Forum that is, you know, in some small way, uh, funded one by one of the the invest that one of the um, uh, philanthropy arms of Goldman Sachs, I think, and they're like yeah, very, yeah. very, very radical. You can go on their website and find. I'm not joking about this. I I recommend people do it. Find uh, lectures that are pro North Korea. That's how far extreme left these people are. Um, mm -hmm. You saw that with Ramsey Clark's organization, International Answer. <clears throat> they are pro North Korea too. They plan a lot of these protests. You see those yellow and black signs. It's always International Answer. So I don't worry about terrorism. I worry about the fact that you have these young, impressionable, dopey kids who have left mom in Indiana and now in the big city, you know, from being the smartest kid in their class to now being, well, this is what the this is what the radical kids in my campus think. And that has shifted so much that you see people talking about this stuff and not even blinking. And one final thing, you were talking about anti-Semitism before and about what which part of this stuff is anti-Semitic. It's hard to disentangle a lot of that stuff. I don't think most of it is. But these are kids that have been radicalized in a way that they are literally standing beside anti-Semitic organizations mm -hmm. in which the charter of the organization, Hamas in this case, is eliminationist in their anti-Semitism. It is spelled out in their charter that is the, the destruction of Israel and the death of all the people in that region would not be a problem for them. As Golda Meir famously said, if Israel put down its weapons tomorrow, we'd have peace. I mean, if, if Palestinians put down their weapons tomorrow, we'd have peace. If Israel did, we'd have genocide. Uh, that's the people they're sidling up next to. And I think that's the biggest worry.
Yeah. Here, I mean, these, these Camille, here is just a, oh. a video I just want to show you yeah. of, it is cosplaying for sure, but <laughs> to your point of like, now they're embracing these people who do not want peace at all and who commis committed a slaughter just a couple of months ago of all these students, these anti-Israel protesters at UCLA, getting down on their hands and knees and engaging in the Muslim prayer. Okay, I mean, these are the same people who want the Ten Commandments torn down from any building in the United States, but it's fine to go, okay, look at them, look at this. Guarantee you, 98% of these people are not Muslim. They, ha they don't know the first thing about Islam, but over and over, they go down on their hands and knees. We've seen this at the other universities too. I think we saw the same similar video out of Columbia. So I guess now five times a day, they're gonna get on their prayer mats and say the Muslim prayer to Allah, Allah, the same Allah that we're told would throw them off the building if they're gay. I mean, the cluelessness is jarring, but it, for me, having lived through 9-11, and I know you guys did too, it's just like, great, Islam coming soon to a theater near you. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, I mean, clearly, I mean, these kids imagine that they are doing something and it's an act of solidarity with people who are suffering someplace. But because for reasons we were highlighting earlier, they have a very difficult time disentangling their own narcissism from from some imagined form of compassion. Like They're going to make a lot of mistakes. Um, and one would have hoped that once you saw people starting to self-immolate, uh, in protest of what's happening uh, in, yeah. in the Middle East right now, that that might have created a moment of pause on the part of people who are agitating for a ceasefire, who who are agitating against essentially Israel, who talk about you know Zionism being uniquely dangerous and genocide, et cetera, et cetera, that they might have thought to themselves, you know, maybe what we should do is is try to to kind of professionalize our protest movement. Maybe we shouldn't turn the campus into a mosh pit um, and destroy these these buildings that we're supposed to be taking classes in. Maybe if we're going to form a human chain, we try to do it in the most orderly way imaginable. We we take a page out of the book of the the civil rights demonstrators who who famously and bravely and heroically marched despite the fact that they were being sprayed down with fire hoses and having rocks thrown at them and all sorts of other horrific things, dogs um, trained on them. You, you take a page out of those, those people's book and it becomes much harder for someone to infiltrate your protest movement and use it for nefarious purposes. It becomes much harder for us to see circumstances where we're having a difficult time disentangling people who perhaps have a genuine uh, and, and completely legitimate concern about humanitarian suffering. And we don't have a difficult time differentiating between them and people who are actual genocidal anti-Semitic maniacs. Um, and, and I think that it is well and good for us to be concerned in general about terrorist infiltration and to pay very serious attention to any signs that we see that that might be going on. But it would be well and good for these protesters to take uh, to take up the mantle and be a little bit concerned about this as well for their own purposes. To the extent you actually want peace, then trying to tamp down some of the hysteria around these issues is in your interest and in everyone's interest. But if what you're concerned primarily about is how you look and whether or not people are paying attention to you, then being as insane and reactionary and extremist as possible is precisely what you continue to do. Um, and for far too many of these people seem to be concerned primarily about that. President Trump was out there yesterday. There was no trial in session for him. He has Wednesdays off. Um, right. And uh, he got out there and made a comment about this. Let's bring the Palestinians here to America. That'd be a great idea. I mean, like Egypt won't take them. Jordan won't take them. But we should take them. We should take them because I guess we have a whole lot more in common with the Palestinians than the Egyptians or the Jordanians do. I'm telling you, if, Pre if President Biden brings a bunch of Palestinian, quote, refugees into America, he will lose in a landslide. That will happen. Here's President Trump remarking on it yesterday. In addition to the millions and millions of people invading our country from the border, <laughs> Crooked Joe is now reportedly what? planning, this is wonderful news for you people in Wisconsin, to bring massive numbers of Gazans from the Middle East all live to your American towns, your towns and villages. <laughs> your towns and villages will now be accepting people from Gaza. 
Joe Biden seems to determine to — he's just determined to create the conditions for an October 7th-style attack right here in America. It's going to happen. Jeez. He had to laugh. That. <laughs> he had to laugh while doing it because it's such an absurd proposal given the state of the world right now and such a huge gift to Donald Trump in this campaign. It is. I mean, I think that last bit there that there's going to be an October 7th in America is is ludicrous for a variety of reasons. I mean, particularly if it cut, you're going to have refugees that come and establish a Hamas camp and then, I don't know, cross the border. Into well, the I mean, look at what's happening on the southern border. Like there's a, there is a real worry no, no. about who's coming in. So so that this is the thing about this is that I think that I don't think it's going to happen. And I'd be happily come on the show again after the election and take my lashes if it does. But I mean, the I mean, the difficulty of actually making that happen, vetting people, the process of making it happen. It seems that everything that happens from the Biden administration is this calibration of how much can I give to the people in Michigan and the left wing of my party that I don't want them to break off or vote for, you know, somebody. I mean, they're not going to vote for Bobby Kennedy, who's very mm -hmm. pro-Israel. But, you know, I need to keep that coalition together. So it's these little things. I mean, so I was surprised when he said the other day, the administration said the other day that words like intifada, uh, was a pretty strong statement, actually, about using the word intifada. But there is this line, and I don't believe that that is a proposal that is probably realistic, because, Megan, I don't think that they're you know, that dumb. They understand that with the current border situation, just optics uh, are very bad on that. I, I wonder whether so we're going to get my a guess statement is from just Glad. That that's a stop too. You think Glad's going to weigh in on that? Yeah, bring them over. 93% are, are against homosexuality and you go to jail for a decade. And if you're from a certain part of Palestine, they believe it's okay to stone you to death or throw you off the building if you're gay. Where's, I, why, why Glad's too busy making statements about people like me because my view on actual biological sex to, to stand up for gays and lesbians who are, you know, what, the, the new refugees are going to move into the apartment building next to Lambda Legal or what? Fine. I'm sure we're going to have a great time at the neighborhood block party. Just make sure we keep it on the sidewalk. Um, I want to show you what's happening at George Washington University where Shannon Bream tweeted this out. Look what they've done to the founder of our country. Founder and father of our country, this statue. This is George Washington. Uh, a statue of George Washington in a Palestinian flag as a cape with a, one of those kafeas around his head. Hmm. You can't see any part of his face, uh, maybe just like a slit where the eyes would be. And he's wrapped from head to toe. He's wearing some sort of a vest with a bunch of, looks like pro Gazan. Well, no, it's his actual, uh, it's his actual vest in, in iron, I guess the material is, with stickers all over it that are pro Palestinian, pro Gazan. This is a disgrace. They've defiled yet again a leader of our country and has nothing to do with slaves, et cetera. We saw this post George Floyd. Now it's just what? I don't know. Colonialism again. And we let it. You know, I, one of the things I love about Lawrence Fox, he's a British commentator. He's over there in the UK. He goes, he makes it his mission to go around to all these statues and take this shit down. Where's our mm. guy? You know, we need more of those, those fraternity guys that we saw at the UNC Chapel Hill who got up there and put the stars and stripes back up. The other day, right? Then Those guys. are going to have a $230,000 rager thrown in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's amazing. Is, yeah, yeah. A lot of cocaine. It's, it's, it's over that now. I think it's like yeah. $340,000 now. And by the way, for <laughs> I, 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 I honestly think, think acknowledge the silver lining here, are, though. It is it's nice like a, to see that some of these statues are still standing. I, I didn't know yeah. that we had yeah. any more. We didn't look on the uh, bright side. the flag off. Of the United States. <laughs> so that's, that is a, that's a positive development, maybe. Uh, it is It is going to, I should point out that 40% of those kids are going to die of alcohol poisoning in the next two weeks. So uh, <laughs> we appreciate your service yeah. and I will be there for your funerals. And you know JK. that these are the people that clearly would, would say, you know, uh, George Washington, the slaveholder, uh, which you can't mention George Washington without mentioning that in the next breath. And these are not, these are people who are clearly not calling for the release of hostages. Um, and I find that- They hate George uh, Washington mm -hmm. so much. Why did they go to GW University? Yeah. <laughs> Pick another I university. Mean, yeah, well, I, I think I hope was to you online. It. Yeah, it was you know, to, to rename it at some point. <laughs> you know, Megan, as as someone from a country where I imagine lots of people actually have uh, retrograde beliefs, at least my my ancestry is bound up with Jamaica. Um, wow. <laughs> and I'm I'm glad that that Glad isn't agitating against the prospect of bringing you know 
more <laughs> horrible West Indian people to the United States. Um, in, in, That's in what I'm same, doing. In the same sense, <laughs> in the same sense, I I don't think they ought to be harassing you for talking about say biological sex, for example. But I do think you're underscoring something really profoundly important, like the the actual refugee crisis in Gaza. And the circumstances there with respect to the the regional dynamics, the fact that no one in the region, these various Muslim countries um, where or predominantly Muslim countries where there is a great deal of agitation on behalf of the Palestinians with respect to their cause and against Israel, that they're not interested in taking people from this particular area. Um, Even temporarily, even temporarily during a war. That is profoundly, profoundly distressing. And it is certainly a a severe hardship for the people of Gaza. And I mean, honestly, they they are they are, in fact, victims in many, many respects. I mean, Hamas is not a legitimate government by any stretch of the imagination. They are a criminal organization who happen to pretend to be a government from time to time and who are victimizing the citizens of Gaza. You know, whatever the Israeli policy happens to be, that is That is an unadulterated fact, Um, and it is a fact that is elided frequently by people who are agitating against um, Israel, who are, you know, crying about um, their their desire to see a ceasefire. I'm interested in a ceasefire. Um, It's also the case that we would have a ceasefire tomorrow if Hamas were to release the prisoners. And we do know that there is some ongoing negotiations. They they won't even agree to a ceasefire. They they don't want a ceasefire. It's so obvious. Yeah, I, I'm sick of that 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 whole discussion about them and the ceasefire. Like, whatever. We we know you don't want it. We, like, I feel strongly if we were in Israel's position, we'd be doing exactly what they'd be doing. We would be annihilating them More. so that they couldn't unleash another 10-7. And every civilian death is on Hamas's hands. The blood of those civilians is on Hamas's hands. I'm I'm sorry, but that's just the way I I see it. But wait, I do want to spend a moment on these guys at UNC Chapel Hill. So it turns out they're from uh, Pi Kappa Phi. They are the guys who hoisted the stars and stripes back up after the Palestinian protesters hoisted the Palestinian flag. Somebody started a GoFundMe. It's now, as of 8 a.m., it's probably higher now. It was at $340,000 <laughs> to throw them a rager. It's at 421000 now to throw them a rager. And here is the, the pitch whoever started this GoFundMe made to get all these donations. I'm gonna read it. Commie losers across the country have invaded college (laughs) campuses to make dumb demands of weak university administrators. But amidst the chaos, the screaming, the anti-Semitism, the hatred of faith and flag, stood a platoon Mm. of American heroes, armored in vineyard vines in Patagonia, (laughs) (laughs) fueled by Zinn and White Claws, these triumphant (laughs) brohemians protected old glory from the unwashed Marxist horde, laughing at their shrieks and wails and shielding the stars and stripes from Soviet missiles. These boys, no, men of the UNC Chapel Hill, Pi Kappa Phi, gave the best to America and now they deserve the best. Help us raise funds to throw this frat, the party they deserve, a party worth worthy of the boat-shoed proletariat who did their country proud. <laughs> You guys couldn't have written better oh yourselves. Oh, my gosh. That is that, is, is that the free beacon dude that one? Yeah, time? that's like, I love that they're making fun of them in like a gentle, <laughs> fun way. And then also supporting. I Was that even a, was that a serious? Was that something you were just joking? Yes. But America was like, yes. fuck yeah, these guys are amazing. <laughs> I, I'd only have one it's, correction to that, to that statement, though. Not Zen, Lucy. Shout out to my, my homeboy, Coogan. Lucy is a superior product. And that's what you should huh? be buying if you're going to be cheap. What is a Lucy? Oh, wow. I don't even know what it, that is. Lucy, Lucy is a product. Yeah, it is a product. Is Camille, it like a white claw? Were, it, no, no. So Zin is a chewy, a chewable tobacco. It's like these patches. Oh. So, I mean, yeah. these pouches. So if you're going to use something, yes. you should use Lucy, which is- Are you getting paid for this? Yeah, yeah, yes. No, Coogan is a friend. Oh my God. I mean, I'm sure he'll say, slide, if you're, he's, slide me a little money for plugging his product. If you're, if you're from New York, a, 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 a Lucy is when you go to a bodega and you buy <laughs> yeah. a single cigarette. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean L-U-C-Y, oh, not a Lucy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's what a Lucy is. There's one of the- Hold on, there's another update now. Uh-oh. In Uh-oh. our um, in our in our story, let's see the GoFundMe. Uh, stand by. Okay, the update. A programming note for all of you who bleed red, white, and blue. We have identified a world class <laughs> event planner named Susan, and she is already hard at work. She worked in the White House and knows what she's about. Another fine American is wheels down in North Carolina tonight and working to identify all of our noble born 
brochachos who stood down the frumpy <laughs> hordes with nothing more than a pastel shirt and smile. <laughs> GoFundMe <laughs> has dispatched a member of their team to work closely with us and ensure your donations do as God intended to show these guys mm. enough fireworks to blow their Oakley aviators straight off their faces. <laughs> this is unbelievable. <laughs> Who's behind this? <laughs> At this point, they're going to get on a yacht for a month. I mean, the, the this- numbers are getting rather large that's this whole what, podcast though, today is is just like makes makes me want to break out into usa chance from the midriff <laughs> intifada on down like it's only in america people this yeah. is what we do yeah. it, it gives you hope it just gives you hope i love seeing those guys put the stars and stripes back up i really do want to stick them on the george washington statue we should dispatch them to all the college campuses in their vineyards yeah, have money for it yeah and americorps and yes. Megan, to your your fear about shithole countries, um, one of those guys I think is uh, <laughs> the child of uh, Venezuelan immigrants, right? He yeah. came from a shitty socialist country, and he came here and he said, "Look, uh, we immigrated here. This is a great country. Uh, people from my family, and this always happens to first generation immigrants, are in the military and they defend the flag and take it seriously, and so do I. Um, that's what happens when immigrants come here." More often than not, I mean, uh, one of the Palestinian refugee that came to this country was Justin Amash's, uh, I think, father. Uh, both his father and mother are, are refugees. One came from Palestine, and hmm. one came elsewhere. Palestinian Christians. I'm glad that we have Justin Amash in this country. Um, wow. uh, great American. Hope he wins the uh, the Senate uh, uh, primary. <laughs> so much promotion gonna... going on today. Dude, well, I mean, I honestly, <laughs> you you just you just hit on something though, Welch. Like a, a refugee program wherein we're swapping protesters, American-born protesters <laughs> who are majoring in some yes, sort of weird Marxist program for Gazans. Like we send them over, and we get we get one Gaza and exchange program. In fact, I think I think just just because of the quality of these people, we should probably send four of them over mm, for yeah. every one Gazan. And that yeah. that is a program I think a lot of Americans could get behind if the Biden administration yeah. were to take that on. I think that that might actually be a, a win for them. They would have to all meet on the tarmac, Camille, and the, the Gazans <laughs> would be like, what? I don't know what you're doing, you crazy, stupid That's person. That's to be a completely voluntary <laughs> program, though. Yeah, I want to be clear. Yeah, about yeah, Gazans are definitely be, from Russia. If, I don't know how they got there, it, but they uh, do. 100%. Yeah, they're Ukrainian. Can you, I mean, you, can you see Hamas so like, switching places yeah. with these students and going up into Hamilton Hall and being like, there's no lotion. Where's the lotion? Yeah. <laughs> they took it off. Where is the ladder of, to the roof? We need people, to throw some people off. A lot of those people, <laughs> a lot of those people would have an instant conversion. I mean, they would get here and say, you know what? This is America? Great. Death to America. What is wrong you with you people? It is awesome here. <laughs> we decided so to much lean lotion. in. <laughs> yeah, instead of, appreciate instead of sending you home with the cops, we decided to lean in. I'd like you to meet Ahmad. And then yeah. 10 of his buddies, just they're going to spend the night with you. We'll see you in the morning. Maybe we'll find out. All right. Stand by. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and we will switch to some other topics because there's more goodness coming your way. More of the fifth column straight ahead. Do you ever find yourself craving the culinary delights of your favorite local restaurant, but time and energy constraints make it seem out of reach? Or maybe you resort to fast food or pantry meals to save time and money. If so, you're not alone. Exploring the local food scene can be costly and time consuming, but what if I told you there's a solution? I wanna tell you about Cook Unity, the first chef to you service delivering locally sourced meals from award-winning chefs every week. And it's more affordable than other delivery options. Visit cookunity.com MK or enter code MK before checkout for 50% off your first week. With Cook Unity, you can enjoy a chef quality dining experience right at home without the hassle of cooking. Unlike other meal services, Cook Unity is a chef collective bringing exciting culinary talent straight to your table. Experience chef quality meals delivered right to your door. Go to cookunity.com slash MK or enter code MK before checkout for 50% off your first week. That's 50% off your first week by using code MK or going to cookunity.com slash MK. Can your savings weather an economic storm? Think about what you've put away for the future. Inflation can render cash worthless. Real estate can crash like it did in 08. Economies built on a mountain of debt can fall like a house of cards. There are very few physical assets that actually that you can invest in that can stand the test of time. But gold has withstood as a valued form of money. It's why many people are flocking to it right now. And it's why birch gold is busier than ever. Through a little known tax loophole, birch gold lets you convert a retirement account into a tax sheltered IRA in physical gold. And the best part, it does not cost you one cent out of pocket. To learn more, text MK to 989898 and claim your free info kit on gold. 
Again, can your IRA or 401k weather an economic storm? If not, consider looking into Birch Gold. Text MK to 989898 and explore securing your savings today. Update for you from the Donald Trump trial, where uh, they are now cross-examining the lawyer for Stormy Daniels and for Karen McDougal, the playmate with whom Trump allegedly had an affair, both of whom allegedly tried to get money from him so as not to disclose this. Their lawyer is named Keith Davidson. He came right before Avenatti for Stormy. And what the defense lawyer, this guy, Emil Bove, is trying to do with Mr. Davidson now, because it's time for cross-examination, this guy on direct talked about how he dealt with Michael Cohen. They struck a deal. He wanted money, um, in particular for Karen McDougal, $150,000, so she wouldn't go public with the story, and the National Enquirer paid it. Now it's cross-examination time, and Trump's lawyer is making him look like an absolute scumbag. That appears to be the cross-examination uh approach, strategy. Uh, This from the New York Times. He establishes Davidson has never met Trump. Mr. Bo continues to try to create distance between these deals and Donald Trump. Trump's defense is in part, I don't know what the hell Michael Cohen was doing. You know, like he he was out there and my people, like they're out there doing what they're going to do. Michael Cohen took out a home equity loan to pay off Stormy Daniels. It wasn't at my hand. Um, Okay. Bove returns to the topic of how Michael Cohen desperately wanted a job in Trump's White House and is bitter that he didn't get it. And that's why Michael Cohen's going to be lying about Trump when he takes the stand. He um, gets him to testify that he t- act def- that he acted despondent, Cohen did, on a call with Keith Davidson when he didn't get the job. Davidson asked about the call, says, quote, I thought Cohen was going to kill himself. He thought he was going to be the attorney general. <gasps> oh, oh, my God. Mm. Oh, Anything's my possible. God. <laughs> I mean, you know those crazies who say, like, if Trump wins, I'm moving to Canada? Like, if Michael Cohen had become attorney general, I might have considered it. Like, I'd have to at least look at where else It'd we could It'd be funny, though, the coats. Oh, Come on. <laughs> oh, I mean, truly, like, okay. Bo is now trying to paint Davidson as a serial extorter, asking for money in various situations and being mindful not to cross the line into actual extortion. Bo is successfully digging up unsavory episodes from Davidson's past to cast him as shady. Uh, a former client of his leaked info that Lindsay Lohan was in rehab, extorted Charlie Sheen. Uh, this guy, Davidson, has resorted multiple times now to, I don't recall, I don't recall, I don't recall. Mm. Um, suggest the money to Stormy Daniels. Oh, both the defense lawyer, increasingly headed toward the suggestion that the money to Stormy may not have been paid to cover up an affair with Daniels at all, but because Trump was being shaken down, in other words, they just wanted to, you know, get his money. It doesn't, who knows whether they actually had an interlude. The guy says, well, I have, I've had over 1,500 clients in my career. This is, I guess, why he remembers nothing. And uh, they're saying his, he appears something akin to ashamed, forced to answer questions about other celebrities who his clients purportedly had relations with and from whom they sought money to stay quiet. They're trying to paint him as, you know, this is all this guy does. He sees a celebrity with a deep pocket and he finds a way to extort them for money so that either an actual affair or the allegations of one don't hit the front page of any given tabloid. This sounds very effective in destroying this guy's credibility. What do you guys think? Uh, It certainly sounds like it. I just want to fast forward to 2030. Like this, <laughs> there will be a time when we're not talking about this crap, and like <laughs> our politics will move to a different place. Maybe it'll be worse, but it's I'm I have fatigue over even knowing Michael Cohen and a universe <laughs> of where politics is is all. I get it; it's entertaining, but like hush money and stuff. And why are we having a trial about this? And why are we uh, insisting that the presidential candidate is as crazy as he is? Um, mm has to have his ass in a courtroom seat for a whole big swath of his campaign or else he'll be in contempt. Uh, The whole thing is just, it's very dispiriting. You know, Megan, every single time we talk about the Trump legal case, I want to sort of turn the tables and start asking you questions. I mean, there are two things (laughs) that I'm wondering about right now. The first is like Michael Avenatti, who I know has called into MSNBC at least once to be, to do like jail, jailbird, um, legal correspondent via collect call, which is like kind of hilarious and really sad at the same time, because I don't want anybody to be in jail, to be totally honest. Um, <laughs> oh, I is he going to be called is the first question. The second question is, what is your 
sensibility about the case now that we're into it a little bit? Are you thinking like the odds of conviction, have they risen? Have they fallen? Is it too early to say? If this were a fair jury, you know, actually interested in the evidence and were they properly instructed on the law, it would be Trump's easily. He, he would be acquitted. Mm-hmm. But I do think, I said this the other day, in the same way um, Marsha Clark lost the OJ trial once, once she didn't move the venue and got the jury she got, like that's, she lost then. This, this mm-hmm. trial too has already been lost by the fact that it's mm. being tried in Manhattan and they've got the jury they do. I mean, maybe there's somebody on there who will hold out. I, that could happen. But the overwhelming odds are that that didn't happen, that they all have um, the proper New York City liberal elite credentials, that they can't stand Donald Trump and that they can't wait to find guilty. And frankly, even if they are fair, they're going to be given legal instructions when they get the jury instructions that are so awful and not consistent with the actual state of the law that the you know there are horses that are being led to, right to the water and they will drink but it's wrong i mean this judge it's a long story but the short of it is the jury instructions should say if you find that the type of money paid to stormy daniels is the type of money that would only ever be used to advance somebody's electoral chances then you may proceed to finding whether Trump actually paid that money. That's what they mm. it should read. And for them yeah. to say, do we think that the hush money is only ever paid to advance an election? Oh, wait, no. Men have been paying that for since the dawn of time. Okay, so now what should we do, Judge? It The next line should say, then acquit. Then acquit. Because there's no underlying crime that would have revived the dead misdemeanor of falsifying business records. But what's, what it's actually going to say is, do you think he conspired to try to win the election with Stormy Daniels or her representatives? And only the only way they're going to say no to that is if they really believe he and Michael Cohen didn't talk at all. And I don't think they're going to reach that. So I think he's losing. He shouldn't be, but he is. And I stand by my original prediction that he's going down. He's going to be convicted in this case. But anyone's guess whether or not there's actual jail time involved here. Yeah, there's no way there's getting to jail time. I just think that's a left-wing fantasy that, you know, Andrew Weissman spins the little MSNBC viewers into thinking might happen in, you know, the mornings when he's feeling a little lonely. That's what he thinks about. And uh, lotion. And lotion. it's not happening. I'm <laughs> stunned. There's something seriously wrong with his judge if he tries to put Trump in jail over there. I don't, I don't think so. Okay, now speaking of horrible things and people, But there's been eight years of those expectations, people, by the way, yeah. <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. speaking of horrible things and people, Christy Noem was out there trying to defend her dog killing. <laughs> she gave an interview to Sean Hannity last night. The audience knows the story by now. We did a whole hour on it the other day. Uh, and this is how she's trying to spin it. Take a listen. I guess people, because uh, you shot the dog, said, is there a difference which way you put a dog down? I'm not really sure, but I don't, I don't think people understood it. I want to give you a chance to explain. Well, Sean, you know how the fake news works. Um, they leave out some or most of the facts of a story. They put the worst spin on it. It was a dog that was uh, extremely dangerous. It had come to us from a family who had found her way too aggressive. We were her second chance. And she uh, was, the you day she it. was put down was a day that she massacred livestock that were part of our neighbors. She attacked me. And it was a hard decision. And the reason it's in the book is because this book is filled with tough, challenging decisions that I've had to make throughout my life. That most politicians, they will run from the truth. They will uh, shy away and hide from making tough decisions. I don't do either of those. Okay. It wasn't fake news. It was your book. It was your stupid story that you chose to disclose. We're going off of what you wrote, you dumbass dog killer. Now it's no longer a puppy. Hello, it was 14 months old. There's no getting around how old the dog was. Now she calls it a dog, but it was a, it was a puppy, and she says it, it was massacring the, the chickens. It's, it was a massacre. It's a dog. It's a dog. She, it wasn't trained. What do you say? I had to stop the massacre, and it attacked me. It attacked her. She says in the book when she tried to pull the chicken out of its mouth, like most dogs will do, who are yeah, you know aggressive and untrained. <laughs> when you try to pull something as valuable as a chicken, dogs like us see chickens as food. So the dog is following its Delicious. natural instincts. This is a fail, a complete fail. What do you guys think? <laughs> I think that is one of the greatest interviews that I've ever seen. Up, up there with Christine O'Donnell's, I'm not a witch. Because uh, <laughs> when you think about what she's saying, she's like, you know, the fake news, sometimes as a politician, you have to make 
tough decisions. And I'm like, you just you shot a dog. Like that's what you're, you're saying. It's not like, oh my God, Russia has invaded Ukraine. What do we do? It's like you just shot a dog. And you literally say, you literally use the word massacre because it ate chickens because it was hungry. It was it's like a genocide. That was genocide, <laughs> Joe. Was like, and you have her genocidal dog. Uh, I mean, so there are a couple of things about this story that are that are a bit difficult. I mean, one, she also shot a goat, which from what I understand, because I read the story about this, the book isn't out yet, so I haven't seen it. um, it, She shot them on the same day, maybe even buried them. One right after the other assembly line. That's I mean, speaking of massacre, to to think, you know, you you killed the dog. Yeah, she blindfolded the goat. I'm already in. Just it. kidding. No, she let me, didn't. Let me kill the goat. No, she didn't, cigarette she didn't buy yeah, the goat. But, <laughs> but the details appear to be that she was shooting the goat and the goat jumped right as she was getting ready to shoot it. So she had to shoot yeah. it again. So like yeah. actually get it down, which, you know, that that's unfortunate. But no one cares about the goat. We only care about the goat. The goat doesn't get enough airtime, Camille. We, we occasionally eat goat. But I will say that the other part of this that is challenging, I'm just going to keep it a, a, a buck with you. OK, because I feel like we're in a circle of trust here. <laughs> if she were a less if she were harder to look at, mm-hmm. it would be easier to condemn her yes. because, you know, killing dogs is bad. But I mean, I mean, Me- Megan, if you, if you saw <laughs> oh, our Biff Calm text, not feeling that one. No. you would realize no. that Camille has a problem that he yeah, is obsessed with her. Yes, and he's I'm not like, obsessed. Yeah, you, not he loves Chrissy. No, I could. I, yes. <laughs> this is not true. Uh, 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 he's Chrissy. This Nome is, is like, the lie. like I could send you a message that it was said, like, you know, she just denied the Holocaust no. and you would send back a picture of her. Like, you know, but like, she's pretty attractive. It's you could be next Corey Lewandowski. No, there could I'm, be an opening I'm, there for you, Camille. This is, this is political analysis. Pure, pure and simple. I am, I am looking at this the way a voter would. And yeah. most voters are going to look at her and say, you know, most did yeah. you, maybe the dog had no. it coming. How yeah. short was the no, dog skirt? No, they are like, not. There are the, questions that the they're going to ask are that they wouldn't her. ask. Yeah. Red states I mean, and blue states. Corey Bush. I'm just and now, Me- after Megan the fact, she wants to build the dog into Cujo. But I'm sorry, <laughs> we read the original account, at least as yes. printed by The Guardian, which is yes. quoting from her book. And that's not yeah. how she styled it. She said it killed some yeah. chickens and it was distracting her on the hunt. And by the way, she was like, it was a, it was aggressive and it was mean. Like you yeah. said, oh, and it was really hard for me. She talked in her book about how I hated that dog. I hate it. Yeah. Oh, it wasn't yeah. so hard for you? Like, like, it's not hard at all. Like you said, it was like a serial kids, killing. The kids have, came but... home. The kids came home on the bus and are like, hey, where is uh where's yeah. pepper or whatever the yes. dog's yeah. name? Popcorn. Yes. I paprika. shot it in the face. Cricket. <laughs> like Cricket. a real leader. <laughs> he's he's dead. Come over here and help me bury it. <laughs> that, we're gonna do this before dinner. I do want to end <laughs> with Camille. Tonight. I wanted yeah. to tell you that if a woman was attractive enough, I would shoot a dog for her, but yes. she doesn't qualify. I'm yeah. just going to tell you. You're going to be really, you're going to be like a Estonian model and I'll shoot a dog for you. <laughs> my, yeah. I, we my had the conspiracy. funniest talk. My mom, my mom put our dog, Bess, down. She was 10. She was a shepherd and Bess had lost control of her sphincter. And that was the um, end of Bess. And- yeah. Ever since we have been suggesting, we've been calling my mom the hillside strangler because yeah. the dog, oh, no. we feel the dog wasn't yet ready to go. <laughs> and, yes. oh, no. and by the way, <laughs> another dog had been put down, but that dog had bitten 11 people, including our neighbor in the face. He did a flying leap off of our, our staircase. In did your mom face. do it herself? So, like, no, she but she brought, dog, like, I'm just saying there was like a pattern and we joked, like when she married my stepfather, we would warn him, like, be careful about the sphincter because you, <laughs> next thing you know, yeah, <laughs> so, you lose lose I was talking yeah, to my mom yeah. about how horrible the Christy No story was. And, you know, my mom was like, well, you know, well, I'm like, oh, hillside, hillside. <laughs> <laughs> gotta do what you gotta do. My conspiracy theory, um, which I'm going to spread uh, uh, throughout the land, is that uh, Christy Noem had a, a ghostwriter, and, and his name was J.D. Vance. Because now <laughs> J.D. Vance is a candidate for vice president, and she's not. Yeah. Clever. Mm. I like That's that. A, I don't clever. care how many interviews she gives on Hannity. Yeah, Sometimes exactly I love to watch up. him, like, try to help the guest, you know, like, I guess, I guess there are a number of ways you can put down a dog, you know, do you think it's the the way, you know, like, yeah. We, <laughs> yeah we that do dog so. uh, had praised Adolf Hitler, correct? correct. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was actually a Nazi. Was do you guys have any thoughts on who Trump's likely VP choice is? I mean, Silence. That's a tough one. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. 
I, I don't know. I mean, I've, I, have we talked about this on the show? I thought we had. No. I, mean, I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm going to be wrong about this. So, and there's probably about a thousand other things in this episode that I'm going to be wrong about. <laughs> you know, like there's going to be a Gaza encampment in the middle of Chicago in six months or something. <laughs> so I will, I will withhold uh, saying the JD. Vance All right. Well, let me give you, let me give you two choices. Um, I think we can safely rule out Christy Noem. Uh, JD Vance or Tim Scott? Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. Can we rule out Christine? I mean, the, the yes. reality is that Donald yes. Trump, yes. Donald Trump seems to pick his lawyers from a lookbook. Like yeah. I, I'm not she sure. Ruined, that he Trump do is the too same smart to pick her now. Candidate. He's too smart. There's other hotties in the world. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. hotties who don't kill dogs. Look at Tim yeah. Scott. So who does, who does yeah, he think Tim is hotter? Tim, Tim Scott. Yeah. Tim Scott. <laughs> he thinks Tim Scott is a good looking man. No, no, no. I, I don't, <laughs> I don't think that he, he's going to need someone who can absolutely look in the cameras and be totally convincing that, Trump is the is not the true messiah, but he's the he's the the leader of American politics. This is the way that we need to go. Tim Scott, when he when he does that, it's a hostage video. Like, mm -hmm. and it's yeah. and it makes you feel bad. Like Marco yeah. Rubio is apparently on the short list. He's not going to get it. He just likes to humiliate Marco Rubio for sport. <laughs> it can't be like Rubio. Cat of the mouse. He's from Florida. It's not going to be. It's no chance. So I, you should put Mitt Romney really on the short list. JD right, Vance well, we used to not to be a Trump it. fan, but uh, but yeah, he's uh, he's a great Trump whisperer. Mm. I got to go. You guys are the greatest. Thank you. Go support them at wethefifth.substack.com. Uh, have a great weekend, everybody. We're off tomorrow. We'll see you Monday.